We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. We are uh, starting this session of the IDEA 21 Open Forum on the topic of digital cyber risk management at the age of COVID-19. And hello to all of you uh, around the world joining us, uh, hopefully. Uh, my name is Limor Schmeling, and I'll be moderating this session. I'm the Managing Director of the Israel Tech Policy Institute. And firstly, I wish to thank uh, IGF for, host for hosting the session and especially acknowledge Amit Ashkenazi and Reut Tondovsky from the Israel National Cybersecurity Directorate who have put together this wonderful and very timely panel. And I'm excited and looking forward to our discussion today. We have an excellent lineup of speakers with very practical experience to share with us. And I want to look back uh, just for, for a short minute at my personal experience in tech policy, which is very much, much anchored in the data protection and privacy space. Uh, where we have had legal tools at a strong level, including enforcement powers and agencies to enforce them uh, for many years already, starting with the OECD guidelines on, on data protection and the EU directive and country laws. And since 2018, the GDPR has become a gold standard, influencing many nations' laws in all continents and proliferating into practice in the private sector through uh, global uh, collaborations and commerce. Uh, we have years of experience with enforcement efforts and regulatory insight, and still many challenges remain in this digital space of uh, data protection and new challenges emerge constantly. Moving into the cybersecurity space or the digital uh, security space, uh, we do have the uh, OECD 2015 guidelines, but uh, we have, I think, less available legal tools and effective enforcement tools, uh, yet the need is here, it is urgent, and it is critical. Uh, the rapid and extensive transition of organizations, employees, and people around the world around uh, di to di digital means due to the social distancing requirements in the past few years uh, with the COVID pandemic uh, really required and created an unprecedented uh, huge bed of growth for digital crime, digital terror, digital risk. And our goal in the next 60 minutes with the help of our uh, excellent panelists will be to share best practices and lessons learned uh, for dealing with a hyperspeed digital transformation of nations' digital spaces, which started even before the COVID pandemic and got accelerated in a major way by it. And how do we face the enhanced dangers from cyber risks? And how do we make sure that our macroeconomic and, and society stability is not compromised and, and kept? And can we ensure cyber stability supports our economic uh, um, well-being when the digital space is borderless and we need this to happen fast. We need this to happen now. Uh, spoiler alert, you're going to be hearing about international collaboration and uh, the need to coordinate between countries. And this is uh, uh, a good thing since we have here uh, na national experts in this field. And our hope is that today we, this dialogue will provide support to building a multi-stakeholder partnership that will facilitate uh, cyber-related knowledge sharing and uh, uh, best practice uh, sharing. So let's hear from our panel of experts uh, how this can be done. And we will start with Dr. Bushra Al-Blushi, the Head of Research and Innovation at the Dubai Electronic Security Center. Uh, so Dr. Al-Blushi, thank you for joining us uh, today. And my first question to you is, how does Dubai balance this very rapid digital transformation with cyber risks emerging and uh, persisting? Thank you, Limor, uh, for the introduction, and uh, thank you, IGF organizers, for inviting me in this uh, interesting uh, panel. 
it's great it's my great honor to be among such esteemed panelists today um, so as we all know and agree uh, cyber security is the core for the digital economy success and flourishment and uh, in a city like dubai where we are currently hosting uh, the biggest globally connected event uh, in the world, Expo 2020. Digital transformation is the main, is the main dynamo for its economical growth. Uh, we at Dubai Electronic Security Center, which is part of the Dubai Digital Authority and the main cybersecurity regulator in the city, our role was never been less, than, uh, less challenging than any other cybersecurity regulators around the world. So we are working very closely with our business departments just to make sure that the emerging technologies are always surrounded with the right cybersecurity controls around them. The minimum, let's say, critical controls should be there whenever we are having a new technology that is being released in the city. And we always think about how to balance between the digital transformation and the innovation and the strategies towards digital transformation that we have in such a city and between the cybersecurity. Uh, so we are we are not any more worried about uh, the cybersecurity threats that will stop the critical services, but we are more concerned about cybersecurity events that might impact or approach or an agile approach that we raise the standard or we raise the minimum controls, test them, certify them, and and uh, add up uh, up to the current standard based on what we are uh, what we are facing on a day to day uh, basis. That's super interesting. I, I, I can share with you that Israel's government has also started thinking about autonomous vehicles and uh, trying to uh, think and, and uh, legislate even and start the regulation to support that, including cybersecurity and data protection uh, principles in it. So uh, I'm sure that our colleagues would love to, if, if you have an English version, uh, of that uh, regulation, that would be already a resource that would be worth sharing. I know that I'd be very much interested to read that. So uh, happy to get that from you later on. And, and you mentioned agility and, and being agile. Can you maybe share with us a little bit more about how you do that in practice? How do you close the gap between the, la the lag between uh, technology and regulation and policy, what components do you use in Dubai in your work that makes agility possible? Yeah, so so as I said, usually the legal frameworks, the laws, standards, policies in other countries might take five to ten years from uh, our knowledge and interaction with other countries, but in our case, it's more it's more agile, as I said. So the development and the issuance of the standards usually shouldn't take than one year. And uh, even the strategy development, His Highness recently announced that he doesn't want to see strategies that will, will stay for five years. He wants to focus on agile strategies where we are focusing on outcomes and outputs rather than objectives, goals, and lots of things on the papers without having the real tangible outcomes. So in cybersecurity, we are implementing also the same methodology so whenever there is an announcement for new technology, we are working hand in hand with the government regulators just to make sure at least the minimum controls are there once the technology is being launched. And then uh, after we, we usually give them like one year to implement or adopt the standard controls. And after one year, we go and audit just to make sure that they are aligned with the standard and they understood the standard the way that, that we wrote it. And after, let's say, two to three years, we are going or we are moving from audit perspective to a certification perspective where we, we, we bring an international certification body to implement our standard and just to test the standard against those controls to make sure that what we are doing is matching with the standard with an international, let's say, recognition that says, yes, this autonomous vehicle or this connected vehicle now has been tested and the controls that we have in the standard are, are met, and this car is now ready to be tested in the, in, in the road or in the street. Oh, so, sounds very effective and very uh, um, ex, um, speedy. And um, bearing that in mind and, and, and remembering what you're doing on the national internal level, how would you think we may promote the harmonization between national policies uh, since our economy is global and innovation and technology are, are uh, 
uh, being deployed globally. So how would you maybe recommend that we harmonize these policies between nations? So uh, recently we worked very closely with the World Economic Forum Global Future Council on Cybersecurity, where I'm a member in, and we worked closely with a couple of government regulators and private sectors looking for the current certification issues and whether we can harmonize uh, the current uh, certification process across the globe through multilateral or bilateral agreements. Uh, the paper is titled International Cybersecurity Certification Framework, Pathways to Collaboration and Situational Analysis, if anyone is interested to look into that paper. So through that paper, we recommended the globe or we recommended the government regulator to have a sense of collective responsibility that should lead to collective action between different government agencies, industry, and standard setters. We strongly believe that an international frame, a platform to facilitate the cross-border recognition of cybersecurity certification should be the next step. I've been in discussion with a couple of, of cloud service providers like Microsoft, Oracle, and those big names uh, about how many certifications they should abide to with different countries, uh, including us in Dubai as well. And they have many and they are struggling. And I think the issues is getting worse uh, in, in, in today's uh, situation with having uh, so many data, uh, data sovereignty laws and regulations. So as a service provider or as a cloud service provider, you, know, you need to abide to different role, uh, laws and regulations and certifications that are specific to each country. I know that harmonization is not easy, but at least we can agree on the minimum controls. Why we are auditing the minimum controls every time the cloud service provider is operating in different countries. If we have the base that we can agree, that we can agree on as nations and countries, then it's a matter of adding, let's say, a delta of an additional, let's say, controls that can, uh, that can be implemented at country specific level. But as long as we have sort of a harmonization that will reduce lots of efforts on us as governments and also on the private sector and on the whole nation at the end of the day. Yeah, that, that sounds very, very reasonable. And, uh, and, and this brings to mind, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. El Belushi. And I want to move over to uh, Pavel Stepanik because uh, in our previous conversation, you mentioned cloud computing. Uh, so just to connect this thread and maybe uh, I can invite you to uh, share with us how the Czech Republic is coping with, with the advanced move to cloud computing. How can this be harmonized internationally. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, cloud computing adoption was expanding rapidly even before the pandemic and the pandemic caused that the adoption even uh, in a greater in a great rate. Uh, the use of uh, cloud services is growing rapidly in both the private and public sector. Cloud services can contribute to a more economical, operational, and safer operation of information systems, that's for sure. The user uh, can get central management, surveillance, and, and other stuff. Uh, however, cloud services bring along uh, new risks. In the cloud, uh, the place of data processing is often abroad, and the individual customers uh, often do not know where exactly it is. So uh, the customers uh, don't know the relevant aspects of the legal system of the country, uh, where the data is stored, as they don't know the legal system, they don't know uh, who can access the data also. And there is a significant dependency on the customer of, on the, uh, of the customer on the provider of cloud computing services. So uh, these are the main reasons why we think uh, at NUKIP uh, that it is uh, necessary to regulate the use of cloud computing uh, by public administration. Uh, there are three main principles of our cloud computing regulation. It is trust. We need to check uh, the provider and the service that they fulfill their requirements. There is the transparency. We need to have uh, the information about the data processing where is the data stored, how long, and so on, and responsibility. It is important to emphasize that uh, the public administration body is still responsible for information security, even if it is using cloud services. Uh, on the base of impact criteria uh, that are defined in a decree of NUKIP, uh, the public administration body has to identify one of four security levels of its information system. 
uh, the security level then determines the extent of the security requirements. Um, to be specific, for example, the data of uh, an information system of the level high may be stored only in the EU and the data of the critical level, which are important for the national security only in the Czech Republic. It is also a legal condition for public procurement for cloud computing services that the security level of the offered cloud computing service must be the same or higher than the security level of the public administration information system. So uh, there was really a brief, uh, brief and simplified information about the Czech regulation. Uh, and now to the harmonization. Uh, some of you probably know that in the EU we have quite a new regulation, it's Cybersecurity Act. This regulation, amongst uh, others, stipulates uh, rules for cybersecurity certification of ICT products, services, and processes. Uh, it should be certifi certify the compliance with European cybersecurity certification schemes. And one of the first of these schemes uh, should be the European cybersecurity certification scheme for cloud services. So uh, that could be the tool of European harmonization of the mark of cybersecurity quality of cloud computing and it is now in progress. Thank you. And um, I apologize for forgetting to uh, um, acknowledge you properly. So Pavel, uh, uh, our expert, is the head of legislation for the Czech National Cyber Information Security Agency. So uh, uh, thank you for those comments. And you per perhaps you have a, a thought, what would be uh, um, a practical route to harmonizing maybe this European scheme with other or um, any types of potential discussions that are uh, will be promoting that end. As, as Dr. Uh, Albushi said, uh, we need to uh, stipulate uh, some minimal standard. Uh, and this uh, minimum standard uh, should uh, be uh, on the international level. So uh, I think it's uh, one of the possibilities to, uh, to stand in, in, EU, in the EU to have this standard, uh, which uh, would uh, give the minimum level of uh, the cybersecurity of cloud computing. Thank you. And um, can I invite you to share with us a little more of the Czech uh, experience uh, during the pandemic with the hyper digitization process that influenced? I know that you were working on a strategy uh, during COVID, during 2020, and announced it. So, uh, can you share some insight into that process? Mm -hmm. Uh, there were many, many things happening uh, in the last two years, in the COVID years. And uh, uh, to the uh, Czech National Cybersecurity Strategy, the Czech uh, Act on Cybersecurity Tasks, NUKIP, uh, I, I say NUKIP is the abbreviation for, for uh, National Cyber Information Security Agency in Czech. <laughs> uh, it tasks NUKIP to provide a national cybersecurity strategy and uh, related action plan to a uh, government for its approval. This strategy must be reviewed every five years or in a shorter period if needed. The national cybersecurity strategy is the baseline document that sets the main direction, strategic, strategic goals and approaches for the nationwide effort uh, to achieve the sufficient level of cybersecurity. Uh, as it was said, uh, the strategy was approved at the end of the, the COVID uh, year 2020. Uh, it's action plan a half a year later then. And uh, in the year, uh, 2020 ended one of our national cybersecurity strategies. So we have to provide a new one regardless of COVID. We faced rapid digitization before COVID, uh, but uh, the COVID makes it even faster. Uh, the pandemic uh, within a few months managed to persuade our society that cybersecurity is an important problem that we need to handle. Uh, at times, people had to rely on digital means to shop, to keep in touch with their loved ones, to do their jobs, to ensure the education for their children. And the citizens of the Czech Republic came to realize how much we gain from technology and uh, what it means uh, when it doesn't work. Um, 
I, I, I could mention um, cyber attacks in some uh, of our important hospitals. And uh, by the way, some of uh, the attacks uh, could only be prevented as a result uh, of functioning domestic and international co collaboration and uh, uh, information sharing. Uh, in the year 2020, uh, NUKIP also issued a warning um, it's one of uh, specific measures that uh, uh, is possible to issue uh, according to Act on Cybersecurity, Check Act on Cybersecurity. Uh, it was a warning about the higher intensity of the threat of cyber attacks, particularly in the healthcare sector. And we'll learn about this specific threat thanks to cooperation with other institutions uh, in the Czech Republic and abroad. Um, our national cybersecurity strategy sets a number of uh, strategic goals among the main three pillars. It's confidence in cyberspace, strong and reliable alliances, and a resilient society. Uh, the first pillar, confidence in cyberspace, covers areas like uh, the secure infrastructure, development of capabilities, and so on. But it also covers the confident uh, reactions, and that includes things like uh, developing uh, the national attribution system. The deterrence concept is part of the current cybersecurity defense system. In this respect, attribution is a significant challenge. Determining uh, the source and identity of an attacker is a basic uh, prerequisite for any, uh, any effective reaction. Cybersecurity is not only about securing the technology, it's also about the non-technical aspects. It is important to hold the perpetrator accountable. Uh, I already mentioned the second pillar, the strong and reliable alliances uh, focused on international cooperation. And the third pillar is called the Resilient Society 4.0. And that means that uh, we have uh, the state where cyber threats are minimized and all society can leverage the benefits of, uh, of technology. This is mostly about the digitization of public administration, but also uh, about the digitalization of, uh, um, let's say, uh, digital awareness and education of the white public and uh, expand, expanding the qualified base of the experts because there are the main problems we are facing uh, right now. It's expert, uh, expert basis and uh, overall education as well. And we do at NUKIP a number of initiatives uh, supporting education from young children, students, educators, public servants, elderly people, and of course, healthcare sector personnel. So uh, that's uh, to, uh, to our activities uh, uh, connected to the national cybersecurity strategy of the Czech Republic. Thank you. Thank you. That, that's super interesting. You, you have, you've had a busy year, that's for sure. And um, I have to say that uh, I'm going to take some liberty as a mod moderator and, and comment that the national attribution system is something that really tickles my interest. Uh, but uh, if we have time, I will try and maybe revisit that topic. And uh, thank you for now and move on to our next expert, uh, who is Robert Kosla, the director at the cybersecurity department of Poland. And Robert, I, I saw that you were writing uh, during these past few minutes, quite a few comments. So feel free to just share with us everything that you've collected, listening to uh, uh, Busha and Pavel, uh, that would be great. And uh, let's start with that. And then maybe I'll, I'll post some questions afterwards. Thank you very much, Limor. <clears throat> yes, I, I took some notes, of course, um, as uh, Bushra and Pavel inspired me also to present uh, how we approach the challenges. First of all, of course, to develop the national level uh, capabilities uh, in cybersecurity. So as Bushra addressed uh, uh, the, the, the question of collaboration, the question of um, uh, setting the baselines at the national level, and of course, to promote them uh, for multinational cooperation. So this is something that we are investing we invested heavily in the recent in, in, in the recent um, initiative uh, called uh, Counter Ransomware Initiative, where there have been uh, 32 countries involved um, to, to discuss how to mitigate, how to disrupt uh, ransomware attacks uh, against uh, critical infrastructures and uh, the most devastating uh, attacks, uh, as, as has been addressed by Pavel, against hospitals, especially during pandemia. So, of course. Um, uh, as, as, as a Czech Republic, Poland also, we introduced the um, uh, national cybersecurity strategy in uh, uh, 2019, 
What's more, we covered in this in this national cybersecurity strategy. And there there are two goals, two goals, two strategic goals. The first one is about cyber resiliency against attacks to increase cyber resiliency, and the second is to 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 increase um, uh, information protection at the national level. So of course we uh, following the strategy that is quite short document. This is thirty two pages. We developed the action plan, and the action plan, the major problem, the major challenge for action plan was financing. So the last column in the so we, we identify stakeholders, we identify all the, all the actions covering cyber hygiene, uh, covering cyber skills development, uh, covering qualifications as well. So we're not only IT related qualifications and we formally endorse three types of IT qualifications uh, for the new jobs uh, descriptions. And we also endorsed officially formally uh, three OT uh, qualifications. So this is something that we will be, we will be in, uh, open to share also with, with, um, with other countries, as uh, we think this, this, that could be a good foundation for the, uh, for the uh, recognized uh, qualification model uh, worldwide. Talking about, talking about resiliency, of course, um, uh, I, I admire what, what Czech Republic has done with, with uh, cloud uh, computing. This is also our, uh, that's where we heavily invested. And I, I may say it saved us a lot, a lot of efforts. It, 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 it gave us an opportunity to run our uh, public administration services because most of them been implemented in support with, by the public cloud service. So we, we've been able to develop the national level uh, the national um, uh, cybersecurity standards on cloud computing use. This is the document that, that defined four levels of, of, of information, four, four level of, and, and uh, requirements for four level of information, <laughs> starting with the open data and ending with classified information. So we introduced this, this model. We work with vendors, uh, with global vendors uh, on a, um, a validation program. Uh, so all the services, and right now we have a marketplace for the public administration, and also that may be used by small and regional, uh, sm small and, and medium enterprises. Um, so um, they can contract uh, directly the, the cloud services. And uh, uh, currently in the in this in this uh, repository in this marketplace we have more than 500 services from infrastructure as a service, from uh, pl platform as a service, and ending with uh, software as a service. So this. Um, th this effort on um, increased resiliency based on cloud computing and very strong partnership with public cloud service providers. And I can tell you that because we are talking about COVID time and what was the impact of COVID. When we had the discussion with our, with our national security authorities before COVID started, it was quite difficult to discuss um, the use and how we, can we use um, uh, public cloud services. Of course, there was very conservative approach by, by national security authorities. They've been looking only to the government cloud uh, environment rather than public cloud environment. But of course, uh, we, uh, when we introduce our national, national cybersecurity requirements for cloud computing, we covered both scenarios, of course, depending on the classification of data. So as, as, as COVID has started, we've been ready actually to use, to start to use public cloud services in so critical systems like, for instance, the vaccination registration like um, um, vaccines distribution system. So all those services are actually run based on a public cloud service. And of course, I agree with, with Pavel about, about trust, uh, transparency and responsibility that was, that was covered in validation program. That's what we run with global players. What's more, Poland is actually looking for them, uh, big investments right now from Google and Microsoft um, announcing uh, to build the regions First, Warsaw region in, 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 in Poland by Google, and also the full infrastructure, full region by, by Microsoft, but will support, of course, the, the data location in, in, the, in, in Poland itself. But at least this, both are the areas related to resiliency. And the last point that I wanted to address, I think this is one of the best practices. Um, we implemented at the national level, we implemented a digital wallet. So digital wallet is used by us and by all the, all the citizens uh, to, to store uh, data in one place in electronic format. This is a um, personal ID, this is driving license. This is also related to COVID certificate. So everything is in one application. So it actually helped um, a lot of citizens and we've seen the, the growing number of, 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 of users. What's more, of course, having the federated ID, um, uh, ID uh, supporting this digital wallet. By the way, uh, Poland is the only country in the European Union uh, having this digital wallet implemented in this, uh, in this, uh, in this, uh, in this scale. So we've we, we, we shared this best practice with European Commission, and we also 
offer to, to, to contribute heavily to uh, the process uh, that is ongoing on the revision of e, e -IDAS, um, e EIDAS regulation uh, for, um, uh, for consolidated, of course, the management of uh, electronic identity. So those are then the major activities um, that, that um, we, we implemented in Poland, as I said, I think focus on resiliency, focus on the very good partnership with industry. Uh, so that since in October 2019, we run cybersecurity cooperation program. This is not declarative uh, partnership, but re real real um, partnership with industry. So it's focused on five areas. This is first, it's about to improve the um, uh, public administration competencies in cybersecurity. So industry works with us on the education programs. And we started education for local and regional governments. And up to date, uh, we, we trained more than 6,000 people for last last 12 months. Then uh, we use also this partnership, cybersecurity cooperation program for sharing information of cyber threats. So cyber threat intel intelligence is openly shared by industry with us, of course, to increase our situation awareness and to be, to be better prepared for any type of attacks. The third the related to uh, cyber resiliency is to develop cybersecurity recommendations, security baselines. So we currently publish the, the set of baselines developed together with vendors like Microsoft, Dell and IBM, uh, VMware, and they've been used also during the, the pandemic. Uh, we recommended how to harden the, the remote work and, uh, and uh, the environments to be better protected against attacks. And the, the fourth is it's about preparation to certification and evaluation. So this is something that was addressed by Samsung. They're very strongly interested in evaluation certification of the mobile, mobile platforms, mobile devices, and of course, then the Nox platform. And the final, fi the, the fifth one, it's about dissemination of information about innovations in cybersecurity. So we promote, we work together with vendors, with, with companies, and we promote them the development of the new solutions, software, hardware, and, and the services. So that's how actually cyber resiliency, partnership, and also identity uh, and digital services for the citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert. I have so many questions. There was so much content in here. I'm gonna to just touch upon, uh, I think several points and maybe ask you uh, uh, some short questions. Um, one thing I heard, and I'm making sure that I understood correctly that before COVID there was hesitance to move into the cloud, at least for more high risk type of uh, uh, services. And COVID really gave a push into the cloud both public and not only private and, and really trigger this transition. But still at the same time, I heard that you do, you, you, you do support and, and, and you're uh, glad that you will have regions from cloud or international cloud providers. You will have local regions uh, uh, in Poland. So you can use them in cases where you feel that the risk uh, um, uh, calls for the, the uh, services and the data to remain in Poland, which, which is something that I think uh, uh, has also been shared experience in Israel and probably echoed also in other places uh, around the world. So uh, uh, thank you for that. And it's, it's good to hear that basically we're, we're facing similar challenges and problems and we're arriving at quite sometimes similar solutions. Something that was very interesting that you mentioned in passing, which I want you to maybe elaborate on, and that is disrupting ransomware. And uh, as uh, in Europe and Israel and probably uh, additional places around the world, maybe Busha can share with us also afterward, because I saw you were nodding, nodding uh, ransomware attacks, especially on health organizations and hospitals. How do you disrupt that as a government? What did you do? Uh, this is quite interesting, and then we 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 use any 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 means. So it means, of course, the the legal uh, the legal measures. Uh, so uh, first of all, we collaborate with law enforcement um, just, and we discourage um, victims to pay any ransom. Uh, what's more, we provide support, uh, operational support, and support on site to recovery to recover from the attacks. In most of the attacks that we observed, also including hospitals. Um, uh, when there was a, a direct support from our ransomware expert team uh, deployed on site, we've been able to recover all the data within a within few days. 
So even if the most devastating attack, like uh, one of the regional hospitals uh, targeting or um, where the uh, 1500 of uh, devices been um, uh, encrypted, including of course the, the computer tomography. So all the medical devices will also not, not reachable. Uh, the ransomware expert team, the rapid response team, this is the, the, the team of experts that works and, and the, that gathered a huge experience working not only in Poland, but also internationally. We supported a few countries already with some, some advisories we supported directly Ireland uh, when the when the Ireland faced the attacks against their national uh, healthcare system so we shared the, the information about the the, the, crypt the decryption tools the how to set them but in case of the ransomware attacks the most important is to uh, to recover them the, to recover them the activity to recover the data rather than to capture the, the artifacts so in many cases uh, law enforcement colleagues are focusing okay we need to capture artifacts and we and we need to start to develop the cryptos and from our perspective our observation is completely different so first start to recover the data in many cases this data is not fully not in 100 percent encrypted so in many cases the, the the encrypted are only the the index files of the of the databases so if you know the structure if you even have the partial um, the partial data available, you are able to the, the, the restore the environment. Plus, uh, as we do not recommend and we discourage to pay in the Ramzo, we work with also industry, uh, industrial partners like with Microsoft, Cisco, VM companies to use their services, cloud, in many, many cases, cloud mm -hmm. services or some devices that can be deployed in both, for those victims to help them to recover from the attack. So this partnership based on cybersecurity cooperation program was very, very good. So in, that's what I said, not de like declarative only partnership, but, but the way how we, how we work. What's more, we also use the legal, uh, legal measures uh, to stop uh, information leakage. So when we see that some data, because you know the model of ransomware is not only focused on the ransom to uh, to to give you the uh, access to, re to to return you access to your data, but also not to leak the data that was stolen from the system. So in this case, we work with the legal legal counselaries um, with legal counsels, uh, actually to develop the model to stop data leakage uh, in using the the court orders. So it's quite effective model, and um, it was it was developed by by, by us together with some um, also also British um, British uh, legal teams, and it's this is something that we that we promote. We share this with with other other, other countries. So I think this is the, the model. Of course, first follow the money, but this is the, the for law enforcement, and then follow the information. So when we see that information is leaked in the dark uh, dark space, we can we can actually follow and see the sources and we see we can also track the sources where uh, and, and the, the media that are publishing this uh, this leaked data so we capture this and we follow this this type of information and we've been quite effective in, in stopping this so that's why we share this this best practice uh, during our counter ransomware initiative meeting now sounds fascinating very practical and thank you for sharing this i see we already have uh, questions starting in the chat but uh, first we'll uh, finish our round of experts with Alita Shkenazi, the head of legal for the Israel National Cyber Directorate. And uh, Amit, maybe you want to start? I know uh, we have got a couple of questions prepared, but let's start maybe with your comments on the same question. How do you disrupt ransomware? How do you uh, help hospitals get back on their feet and, and during COVID, during a pandemic, which is the, 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 the worst place to be hit during a pandemic? Thank you, Limor, and uh, thank you all of the panelists for these uh, very illuminating uh, comments uh, and important comments. I think that uh, one of the things that uh, are on the one hand are optimistic, on the one hand are pessimistic in our line of work is that a lot of the solutions are simple. And uh, therefore, uh, some of the events that we've seen, simple cybersecurity hygiene can solve some of the answers. And this goes both to, if you like, uh, very heavy duty type events like the colonial pipeline attack in the US, which at the end of the day, as we understand it from public reports, is because of uh, using um, single factor authentication that enabled the, the attack. And the fact that it was unclear whether the IT system was separated from the OT system, i.e. the system that ran the pipes. So a lot of the measures indeed are based on being prepared. The other thing, again, and this again goes to preparedness, is everyone talks about backups, but we should make sure that our backups are not connected to the same system that may be infected. So again, pessimistic or optimistic, if you do your 
if you uh, take your pills and do your exercise, you will be okay, but again, things happen already. And here, I think that uh, the things that we've heard from our uh, Polish colleagues are quite innovative and uh, things that uh, we should consider about what the, the country can do uh, in these areas and how we can uh, indeed uh, make things uh, uh, come back uh, to uh, function as fast as possible. I think in this context, uh, cloud technology is indeed one of the enablers that uh, we can uh, see. Um, it uh, is useful because it is native in its forensic abilities and its IT abilities. So we are not as reliant on the IT administrator in the organization. We can rely on some of the things supplied by the infrastructure itself. And it also enables better recovery. Um, I think though that at the high end attacks, we need the, the country to do uh, even more and uh, use some of its uh, capabilities, law enforcement cooperation, cross-border cooperation, industry cooperation to see whether we can uh, actually um, be more proactive in uh, helping the organizations in deal with the situation. And Robert uh, talked about this very explicitly, helping the organization um, maybe decrypt the files or uh, use the backups and come back to, uh, to usual function. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Amit. And uh, now maybe going a bit uh, higher level and uh, I want to ask you, um, what can you recommend as an effective approach to, to other countries in, in, in uh, from your experience of many years uh, in this space and, and specifically in light of Israel's recent years uh, pivot in its approach to how you do cyber protection or cyber right. defense. So, so um, I guess, uh, I guess the, the comments are basically quite simple. I, I think that, uh, I think that uh, one of the things that uh, we should overcome and this, the IGF is a, such a wonderful forum to talk about this message, is the need to bring together different communities and stakeholders. We need to bring the technological people talking with the legal people, talking with the policy people, working together so that we um, share the responsibility to make systems more secure. And uh, this, this uh, would seem to you a very basic message, but I think it's necessary both in dealing with, uh, if you like, the older types of uh, risks and the new development technologies type of risk that we've heard from Dr. El Balushi of dealing with connected vehicles. We need all of the stakeholders to be aware of the role in, in this area. And especially we need the non-technologists not to be afraid to talk with the technologists and deal with uh, their role in uh, accountability and governance of uh, technology. Now, these are uh, things that every country and every policymaker, I think, can apply in his or her respective uh, field. And uh, I think that this is the basic uh, infrastructure upon which we can build more and more floors, if you like, for the more developed uh, use cases for cloud, for autonomous vehicles, for 5G, for quantum, etc., IoT. But I think that once we have this in place, the understanding of a continuous dialogue between different types of professions, and uh, that this is a, a, a shared responsibility type of approach, then I think uh, we have a strong groundwork to do this. And in Israel, we have the advantage of being smaller than other countries, and this has allowed us to foster these communities uh, a lot faster between uh, the different stakeholders. Um, and uh, as uh, I think also uh, was mentioned, there is an important role for industry in, in this uh, area. And this relationship with industry um, has a lot of uh, fascinating uh, elements and it is uh, super important because most of what we use is created by the industry. But what we're seeing in recent years in Israel and in other places is the role of the state in these relationships. So we are not only accepting technology and products as such, but we also are asking for more accountability and responsibility. Uh, specifically in Israel, we have uh, done uh, a lot of, we have invested a lot of efforts in supply chain management and standardization of the supply chain, which is an important area. 
Um, and the other, uh, the other thing that we are looking at is uh, our role in helping organizations close their vulnerabilities by locating such vulnerabilities through open, uh, open uh, tools and encouraging uh, vulnerability disclosure programs uh, in collaboration with law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Amit. Um, we have uh, twelve minutes remaining. So, firstly, I'd like to invite uh, Busha and Pavel if you wish to comment and uh, um, react to your colleagues' uh, interventions. Then uh, you're welcome to open your mics and and Robert as well. And let's uh, start with a round of brief uh, comments. Um, I'm really glad to see that common ground uh, we are all sharing over here. So I agree with Robert that uh, COVID pushed lots of things that we never thought that it will be pushed, specifically from uh, the security authorities. Uh, so uh, we are lucky enough maybe in Dubai that we had our certification with the cloud service providers and we were clear what should go to the cloud, what shouldn't go to the cloud before the pandemic. So once it hits us, we were having at least two or three certifications that were issued to a couple of public cloud service provide, providers. It was not an issue, but due to the huge demand that came at a sudden to the cloud service providers, we uh, accepted some exceptions for even non-certified ones, just to make sure that the services will still uh, will still be up and running. Uh, we, we had a basis, but uh, it was pushed a lot with the, with the pandemic. And I agree with both Amit, Kosla, and Pavel about, um, about the healthcare part and how uh, the healthcare was, uh, let's say, target to attacks. And we never expected that. We expected that the healthcare or the research centers one day will be target for attacks. So we were always uh, thinking about uh, the, the energy sector. We were always, always thinking about the other critical national infrastructure. But healthcare maybe was not in the radar of the cybersecurity because it was maybe the least um, uh, interesting aspect for the attackers at that time before pandemic. Healthcare and research centers as well, both of them. Uh, when it comes to Pavel points about uh, the cloud computing, I agree with him that in order to start harmonization, our frameworks should be based on international standards. So the standard that we have in Dubai actually is based on ISO standard purely, plus an additional requirement about um, uh, data geoboundary. So all the standards that we have or all the controls are coming from the international standards, except for the uh, geoboundary things. And this is also specific to specific services that are critical national infrastructure services where we are asking the cloud provider to maintain the data within, within the GU boundaries of UAE. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Pavel, I'm still thinking about the attribution, so feel free to comment, but please say something about your scheme for attribution. Uh, at first, I uh, would like to thank uh, all my colleagues, panelists, uh, for the information they shared with us. Uh, it was uh, super interesting. Uh, to the <laughs> to the attribution, I uh, couldn't be uh, very very uh, concrete because uh, much of the information is of course uh, uh, is of course uh, classified. Uh, but uh, as I could say that uh, in the national cybersecurity strategy, there is uh, the task to uh, to build the attribution framework, uh, national fra uh, national attribution framework. We have to do it uh, since the beginning of the year uh, 2021. And uh, uh, we are uh, working on it uh, very, uh, very, uh, let's say progressively. It's, uh, uh, it's um, something that uh, we built uh, together with uh, very many other bodies. Uh, there has to, uh, uh, it's not only technical, issue it's uh, it's uh, even uh, issue of uh, uh, inform inform it's uh, an issue that uh, we need we need the intelligence uh, uh, from our intelligence services and so on so uh, very many uh, very many uh, 
parts of uh, the state are helping uh, with the attribution and I think the attribution framework uh, is a very important thing for, for uh, the deterrence of, uh, of uh, cyber attackers. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I think that we can definitely sum up uh, uh, initially that there's lots to be done and that a lot has been done. And uh, we've uh, touched on how important it is to work together both on the national level, on the international level, how important it is to harmonize standards, harmonize uh, uh, expectations or certification schemes, again, both on the national level and on the international level, and to be clear and transparent with uh, stakeholders, what is expected of them. And this is uh, this came from all of you and, and I think it, it was loud, loud and clear. Uh, it's very much important to create the, uh, the collaborations with both industry and government stakeholders, because as Amit said, or I think maybe it was Robert, the, the, the stuff that we use is made by industry. So uh, the infrastructure is, is uh, uh, very much in their knowledge and uh, it's clear that uh, the effort needs to be collaborative. Um, I wanted to maybe allow each and every one of you uh, for our last five minutes of the panel uh, before we uh, uh, say goodbye to maybe share uh, what is your dream goal for, the, for your careers in cybersecurity for uh, the coming year, this is almost uh, like a end of year resolution or beginning of 22 uh, dreams. What would you love to see happen in cybersecurity policy? Amit. So um, again, this is the, the magic, uh, right? The, the magic uh, genie coming out of the bottle and always, so I, I would ask for two things basically. In Israel domestically, uh, we have one thing that we are still uh, haven't finished, and this is uh, cybersecurity legislation to finish our uh, the deployment of our policy. We're doing a lot of stuff, but uh, we have an innovative law, and we want it legislated. And on the international front, I would like to see these types of discussions more formalized to create alliances of defenders. So we have seen the we have seen these uh, uh, discussions. Uh, really useful from the technical community, the cert to cert community first, the first organization, but we need to see the uh, creation of better ties between uh, the national certs, the governmental certs of the world. There is the European model, but I think this should be uh, extended outside Europe. And I hope for this defender community that we have uh, better uh, policy and legal tools to coordinate events cross borders. Sounds good. Robert, what is Poland's dream? I'm uh, sorry, I can't hear you. Poland's, Poland's dream and my dream is actually, uh, my dream, I will start with my dream first. My dream for next year is actually to, to be more active and develop uh, reference, cybersecurity reference architectures. That's uh, what we initiated to work with the industry. Uh, based on the, on, the, on the recent attacks and also on, uh, uh, combining components uh, with, that are necessary to increase resiliency of, uh, of the public sector and also, and also um, uh, small and medium enterprises. So reference architecture, first of all, for local and regional governments, and also in the same time, reference uh, cybersecurity architecture for healthcare system. That's what we are working right now and uh, initiating right now uh, with the very strong uh, interest from the industry. So we, we will continue. And the, the national level uh, dream is to, is to amend the law on national cybersecurity system. The, the amendment will include the more uh, power in operational structures. So uh, establishment of sectoral scissors, and this is the idea and the best practice that we borrowed from our colleagues from, from ENCD from Israel. Um, uh, we also, based on this uh, legislation, we will introduce the regional SOCs, regional SOC security operations centers that will support regions uh, in uh, monitoring and management of security. This is the concept that we also shared with, with uh, European Commission. And uh, last week, I just uh, had, a, had a chance to present it uh, in front of the European Cybersecurity uh, uh, Competence Center. So this is the concept that will be also fina uh, financed 
from the resilience and recovery fund, um, the European fund. So that's where we will allocate the, the major major interest. Of course, in, in parallel, we will also invest in ISAC, so information sharing and analysis centers for a specific domain. We have one of them already established, covering subsector of railway, and we are thinking about other ISACs to be established. So that's a dream of uh, amendment and implementation of the, of the project that's been uh, already drafted. Thank you. Good luck with all that. <laughs> uh, Bushra, do you want to share yours? Yeah, so I, I share the same thoughts with Amit and, uh, and Kostla at the end of the day. So at the national level, I hope that uh, we will have more better uh, public-private partnership. So we develop lots of partnership with the government entities and the critical national infrastructure. And now we are working towards improving our partnership with the private sector. So... Uh, uh, we already started that uh, this year by having a collaboration with the private sector. It's an actual joint venture with the private se sector for digital skills. And we are looking for other partnership style for certification, qualification, and, and, and other areas. When it comes to the international side, so as I said, we have the World Economic Forum paper or report that has been published. I hope that this won't stop at the paper publishment or report publishment stage. And I hope that we will take an action towards harmonizing or at least having bilateral or multilateral agreements when it comes to certification. I hope that one time, instead of having those efforts duplicated across different countries, we will have it in one, or at least we will have sort of a bilateral agreements where we, we recognize each other's uh, frameworks and certifications. Yeah, worthy cause. And last but not least. Thank you very much. Uh, at the beginning, uh, I want uh, just uh, shortly, uh, shortly uh, react on uh, one uh, question in uh, question place. Uh, uh, the question is, how are you prepared to address challenges posed by the disruptive technologies? I just want to invite everybody uh, to uh, look at our websites, uh, nukip.cz, where uh, you can find uh, Prague proposals uh, on uh, the EDTs, which is a product of our uh, conference. Uh, we organize a Prague uh, 5G conference, and uh, there are many other materials, uh, for example, National Cybersecurity Strategy of the Czech Republic, uh, it's all in English, so uh, you can you can find some uh, answers there. And uh, uh, my answer to your question, Limor, is uh, is uh, to uh, implement the Czech National Cybersecurity Strategy in the uh, next year as we as we want. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. This has been a pleasure and super interesting and very practical. And I really appreciate all of your contributions and cooperation. And thank you, Amit, for organizing this panel and inviting me to moderate. And thank you, Pavel and Bushra and Robert. Uh, hope to see you soon again and uh, have a wonderful continuous of this conference. Bye-bye.